Oh, that's right. Hey, welcome for those who have joined in and are watching tonight on uh, Buley YouTube Live. Last week, we told you we had a mystery guest. Let the cat out of the bag today via Instagram and Facebook. We've got Eric Ishiwata. He's a good friend of Buley's, a good friend of my own. And um, he has been a steelhead fisherman living in the great state of Colorado for a lot of years. So in between the ability to get out west and chase steelhead, he has learned and taken a lot of patterns uh, with a two-handed rod to figure out what trout will eat, what time of year, when and why. So we got Eric Ishawada tonight. He'll be tying two for sure, maybe three flies if we can squeeze it in. And here we go. Ish, how are you doing? Good, thanks. Thanks so much for making time, Bruce. And I appreciate everybody on Beulah's side for helping out. Yeah, this should be great. We've had, now we've got him. I mean, this is like our sixth really good tire in a row. And Ish, I got to tell you, like, Probably the thing I respect about you most is that you didn't take it to two hand rods when it became a fad. I mean, you've been doing this. I've known you for a decade, and I think you were fishing for trout with a two hander before knowing me. So, I mean, you literally were you just kind of like all thumbs out there trying to figure it out? And how long ago was that? Yeah, I was trying to figure it out last night, and so I think I bought my first Beulah five six classic switch rod in November two thousand eight, and. Uh, it was a disaster. I had the first generation Elixir Scandi head on backwards with about 10 feet of T11 sink tip on the end of that and was wondering why uh, it was tough to even just roll cast the head out. But slowly <laughs> over time, I uh, started to piece some things together. And then by uh, 2011, um, Idlewild started producing some of the patterns that I was um, developing specifically for swinging for trout and uh right about that time i was feeling like uh i have a pretty good handle on things and uh, i was able to get in fish consistently was able to shoot some line out and then uh and then i traveled out to oregon and fished with you guys and saw oh wow uh that's how you cast and uh it's really <laughs> humbling to see folks like firing out 90 foot casts not really thinking much about it perfectly perpendicular to the surface of the river and uh yeah. and then coming back and then i'd say i probably only started to learn how to properly cast uh you know since since then since like 2011 or so but uh it's been it's been great and kind of all consuming since back in 2008 yeah two-handed rods are addictive i mean you know how it is being at work which and you had a two-hander in your hands but uh one of the things that's really cool is that you know just Going from scratch and not really because everybody was, you know, in a drift boat, casting from a drift boat, either nymphing or whatever. But you literally had to figure out what trout would eat from the inception of it and just trial and error, kind of old school fly fishing. And every one of your patterns that I've taken out and used, I haven't even had to think about it. I mean, the confidence is there. The fish eat them. The movement's there. They're easy to cast. Um, I always like tying your stuff. Just, you know, being in Oregon, I tell everybody it's my pattern since you're in Colorado. They don't know the Good. difference. Good. <laughs> yeah. I think, I mean, the first step was really looking at all of the cool Pacific Northwest patterns, even the old school stuff to, to the new school stuff, and then trying to figure out how it would translate to where essentially tail waters, you know, winter tail waters in the Rocky Mountain region, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, and uh, saying, hey, that prawn, prawn pattern is beautiful and prawns are crustaceans and they look pretty much like crayfish so how do i try to size this down and translate it a bit so uh it'll look like a crayfish or i knew i have a lot of great guide friends who are on the river you know 200 days a year and they're saying you know leeches are undeniable so then looking at some of those sweet mole leeches or sweet or string leeches and figuring out how do we um size them down and what types of triggers can you build into them so they can do a couple of things first i always want to make sure that it's castable and then and that it swims well in the water and then and then also uh i like them to consistently uh elicit strikes and that uh you know you could put on the most randomest uh pattern you can think of with wild colors that don't make a ton of sense and you'll eventually find fish that will grab it but um i'm at this point I don't quite get to fish as much as I used to in years past. And so when I'm out there, I'm trying to get the maximum amount of grabs possible. 
And so right. uh, I've kind of narrowed things down to about three to five patterns that I consistently use. Each of those are in different color schemes based on the conditions. And then uh, I like to change up weights and I like flies to be able to change up weights in order to get, get down to where the fish are, which is probably the main difference between steelheading and swinging for trout is um, I think steelhead, if they're in the, if they're in the run the, and, and happy, they'll be pretty generous and they'll, they'll swim up and get it. Um, but in particularly cold, colder temps, uh, a foot of difference in depth could be the, be the, the change that you need in order to be the one that is getting fish or not. And I just had lots of years of fishing with buddies and I would always switch things up and I would always make sure if they have seven feet of T11, then I'm going to have seven feet of a T8. Uh, if they're having a weighted fly, I'm going to go on a wide, uh, a lighter fly, different colors. And through all of that trial and error on the river, um, it became pretty clear weight matters. Um, or I guess, I'm sorry, depth matters. Then uh, the size of the fly matters. Sure. Uh, flash it has and, and color. And those are the kind of the elements that I just cycle through now in order to try to make sure that I get the most grabs I can on the days I'm on the river. And then last question, when you find go-to patterns, like I've always kind of thought that if, if a fly catches a fish, it's really not a great fly just because I made it. But once it catches a fish in my neck of the woods on the Grand Ronde, the Deschutes, the Rogue, the Clackamas, the Coast, then I start to like it. I mean, how did you identify go-to patterns because of different waterways and different times of year? It's like I can fish this any time of year with confidence or how did you arrive at, at your confidence? Well, I think, you know, by 2010, I was super hooked on trying to figure out what, what it is that makes fish grab a swung fly around here. And uh, to the point that usually when I hook the fish on a, fly i'd cut that pattern off immediately and then switch one switch to a different color or a different pattern and see what would work and so i actually probably ended up catching a lot less fish but i was constantly experimenting trying to figure out you know why did they grab them why why are they not eating this pattern versus the previous pattern um lighting conditions water conditions and then uh, i built a lot of confidence on patterns on like the north platte river in different stretches of the North Platte River, and then was able to get opportunities to fish on the Green, on the Bighorn, on the Missouri, and, and the Colorado. And, um, you know, when I dropped into those rivers that I really didn't have a lot of experience in, uh, I started with my confidence patterns and the basics and just kept cycling through. If, uh, you know, I guess that's the other difference with steelhead is, you can fish a run perfectly steelheading and end up with nothing. And, um, and that's because there's maybe no, no fish or no happy fish in the run, but for sure. swinging for trout, they're there. And so if you are not there, if they're not communicating, uh, they're always communicating actually. And so if you're not getting grabs, they're letting you know you're doing something wrong. And usually okay. nine out of 10 days, you should be able to figure it out of, to, to get fish on the swing for trout. Funny, that sounds like a very collegiate professor style approach. Now, what do you do for a living? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, what, let's get to go with some time. What are you going to show us first, Eric? So uh, this is this is a variation of the first pattern that I had with uh, Idlewild. And um, and then now it's produced by Montana Fly Company. And it's a, it's a Grandmaster Flash. And what's new about this one, when it went to Montana Fly, is it's on pro tube pro sport fisher now and then the other thing is uh i got tired of tying flies my key patterns in like a dumbbell lead dumbbell version a cone version and an unweighted version and so i was just hunting for ways where you could change the weight up on the fly on the river and just tie one pattern and so uh i was actually i think complaining to bruce Maybe in 2012 or 13. Like 2012. That's 2012. Exactly right. I was complaining. I think we were at a hotel and uh, after uh, one of the shows, and uh, you said, Hey, well, as a matter of fact, let me show you this trick. And I think it's been a total game changer for me. 
What I like about it is I can add and subtract rate, weight on the river without having to um, go out to the, like weight out of the river and change sink tips. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, cutting the hook off and then sliding some of the weights around. So I'm gonna show how to do that pattern. Um, this is my go-to searcher. It, um, it usually elicits strikes from the most aggressive fish in the run, not necessarily the biggest, but the most aggressive. If, I, if it's just me, if I'm the only one fishing, I'll probably fish this pattern all day and I'll fish it in a variety of colors. But um, a lot of my buddies like fishing it too. So if I'm coming behind my buddy, I'll, I'll use a different pattern. But if it's up to me, I'm going to fish this pattern all day long. Right. All of trout flies seem like the blue and black of the steelhead world. Am I right? Wrong? What's that? All of trout flies for swinging seem like blue and black in the steelhead world. What do you mean by that? I mean, blue and black will catch a steelhead anywhere. And yeah. it seems like all of is kind of a color that can oh, catch a fish of, anywhere. Oh. I thought you said all of, not all of. All right. of. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, blue and black actually works in, in low light conditions. I actually like going to blue and black if it's um, if it's like an afternoon, maybe three o'clock, but super overcast. This blue and black with a uh, uh, orange head uh, ends up being pretty good. But the version I'm going to tie today is the number one pattern for really dark. So the last two hours of light during the day, uh, it's okay. going to be a black copper and chartreuse. And it starts with uh, this flexi tube, 4040. Yep. Can you talk about how this is uh, constructed? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of cool. And even though it's just a piece of plastic, uh, this guy named Morten Bungard from Denmark was the first guy that he was an Atlantic salmon fly fisherman, didn't really like the current state of affairs with tubes. And he was a robotics engineer and a plastics engineer by trade. So he decided to injection mold the first ever fly tying tube specifically for the purpose of fly fishing and fly tying. So it's a two diameter, 40, 40 means there's 40 millimeters of junction, 40 millimeters of tying surface. And the other thing that's kind of cool is as you're doing right now, they can be cut apart and the inside diameter of the small side fits, or excuse me, the outside diameter of the smaller surface fits the inside diameter of the larger surface. So that makes your weight adjustable system, which you're about to put together right now. Yeah. So this is how it comes. I just chopped out this middle connector segment. I'm going to pull that out. Yep. And then as Bruce was saying, this smaller diameter piece, it snugs right into the larger diameter piece. And it stays. I mean, you can cast with that all day long. It's not going to come apart, which is nice. And um, this is uh, something that just gives the fly tires a lot of versatility. For those who don't talk in millimeters, 40 in the rear end means about an inch and a half. 40 on the front end means about an inch and a half. So there you go. It's a three inch long tomb roughly. And you can even tie the body on the fat side and finish on the small side, or you can tie 100% on the small side. That looks like you're putting on a couple of raw weights. Yeah. So these are tungsten raw weights. Um, the most I'll ever fish it would be the heaviest would be one medium size raw weight in the front and then a small raw weight in the back. Typically, I'm only using one small raw weight, but I'm going to I'm going to put these in when I start tying just to make sure that uh, I keep myself honest and have enough room to add and remove weights as, as I put the materials on. Yeah, that makes sense. Then you can make it lighter or heavier if you even wanted to. But those raw weights are no joke. That's like 99% pure tungsten. Most, I mean, most steelhead runs, that fly would be in the bottom of the river as soon as it hit the water. So sometimes people wonder, oh, how do you tie on tubes? And once it's in the vise, in this mandrel, you just tie on it the way you would a hook. That's a really important thing for people that have an experiment with tubes. There's no mystery in it. It's very, very straightforward and simple. And so one of the things that was pretty clear when I was looking at the cool patterns in that intruder area era was they always like to put in some sort of bulk or shoulder in the body of it to help create um, some volume without maybe loading it up with a ton of wool or something, wool head. And so, um, I'm going to use, this is a hairline product called Straggle Chenille, Straggle Fritz Chenille, um, or Fritz Chenille. This is size uh, medium. If I were going to use it for heavy water or if I were going to go out to steelheading, 
particularly winter steelheading, I'd use the large size, but this medium size is going to be good good now. Okay. And How different is that than a cactus chenille or some other type of chenille that's similar yet different? Uh, I think the fibers extend much further out on this. So okay. it's probably about close to a half an inch from, from the core, maybe three or between a quarter and a half, a half inch. Uh, the large is more like a half inch. Uh, and if it were um, just cactus chenille, it'd be about half the, the width. Okay. And are those fibers about the same or are they more densely packed or is that just work? Of what, I know you've tried probably everything, but that probably makes the perfect shoulder in your mind. In my mind, it makes the perfect shoulder. And right. I like the I like the ones with that have some fluorescent or UV elements to it, just because in the core of the fly it'll kind of glow. So I did three. I just folded that back like you would a wet fly hackle. Do three or four um, turns. You you answered the question without me even having to ask it. Answer that good. <laughs> then. Then um, I like to then make the displacement even broader by putting a couple wraps of a, a feather in front of this fish chenille. And so you can use any feather. Slopping would be totally fine. Uh, I like the silver pheasant because of the barring on it. And so I'm just gonna prep it and uh, tie it in like you would any other feather. Uh, and I'm gonna shoot for maybe just three wraps. And with that barring, I don't know what it is, Ish, but it seems like when you tie a fly through the events of spay casting, you're going to lose, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 percent of what you put on the fly just with like, probably how fast it rips out of the water. But when you're fishing that, do you feel like you can see the barring through the fly? Yeah, first, I'd say I'm a much more gentle caster than you are, so I don't have that problem. <laughs> but beyond that, um I do think there, there's really something to variegation, to barring in patterns. And um, I got a lot. I learned a lot from this guy that was a designer for MEPS spinners and spoons. And uh, in the designs of their spoons, they, they often have barring or something that, that breaks up a solid color. And the idea behind that was if you have something that's all just one solid color against a flat background, uh, it could kind of disappear a little bit. So if you have a brown fly against sort of a tan or olive background, uh, the the outline of that can kind of get blurry or muddied. Um, by putting in contrasting colors or having in barring, uh, automatically it's going to break up things visually and it'll be easier to spot. And so this gets to the other thing on fly design was, you know, the, when I was first coming up with patterns for trout spay, you know, there's a lot of... Um, just attraction towards borrowing from trout streamers. But really the way in which our flies move are more akin to spinners and spoons than streamers. The ways in which the gear guys fish those spinners and spoons in rivers, they cast them out almost like across the river or 45 yeah. degrees downstream. And then it swings at a constant swing the way that our, our flies do. And so I borrowed more from what spinners, spoons, and Rapalas are doing than I did from maybe trout trout streamers. That, that makes sense. I mean, and, and that's been a long evolution, right? I mean, I think this is probably, you know, if, if people had injection molded tubes and these materials available to them, this might have been invented 60, 70 years ago. But I think it's just kind of the involvement of the two-handed rod, the involvement of participation in fishermen and kind of figuring it out but that makes sense to me that to, to, those lure guys are deadly right so if you're emulating what they're doing you're probably going to find fish yeah yeah so king's watching eric and he says um <laughs> that we are what a pair but the question is what grain skagit head do you like to turn over a fly with that medium raw weight or medium and a small does it need to be a heavier skagit to get that fly to turn over yeah, well, uh, for me, I think somewhere right around the four, 400 would be great. So um, I'm still using a lot of the Onyx 5 weight, 12 4 5 weight. And with that okay. one, uh, I'm using the uh, 400 grain tonic on that with usually either, I'm using just those airflow tips right now, the um, 
uh, flow tips. So yep. depending upon the river, I'm either using the T7 or the T11 version, then four feet of eight pound maxima. And then uh, any of these flies in their heaviest versions uh, can turn over with a 400 grain. Right. For those that don't know, the flow tip starts at the back end of the loop with a little bit of intermediate, and then that melts into the sink tip part. So if it's a 10 foot tip, you've got two and a half feet of intermediate, seven and a half feet of sinking material, and then they make them in different densities. So this tail is just ostrich hurl. I'm taking three, three of them, and they're about three inches long. Uh, and I'm going to set them at like 10 and two, if you think of a clock, 10 o'clock and two o'clock, just to kind of get uh, yep. a nice V section. Are you particular to how many strands in each, three to four, six to eight? I usually do about three, but it, I don't really care. Okay. I will say though um, that the the length of the ostrich tail that really defines the proportions of your fly, and that if you go too long or too short on the ostrich, it's going to end up looking funny. But more importantly, it'll swim kind of weird. But here you can see set at ten and two o'clock, splayed out. Then. Uh, Next, I'm going to take Flashaboo. I leave it on stapled, and this is to your taste. I usually pull off about 10 strands or so, maybe 12. Okay. Off the card. This is so that, that tail ish. Back up just a sec. That tail looks, I mean, it just appears to be about one and a half times body length. Is that in the realm, or are you talking more like two times? I don't know, dude. It's three inches long. Tie it, swim it. And adjust it as needed yeah um so yeah i guess you're right it's probably three times i think this is probably okay. about an inch right now so yep so i cut 10 strands off the card we have about 10 inches here i'm gonna wet it so it kind of stays together and then double it up and i'm gonna cut it in half and these are gonna be the flash so i'm gonna leave one of those little bundles down for now and I'm going to slip this underneath my thread about 50-50, so about even. And right now, the flash is on the 12 o'clock, straight on the top of the tube. And then okay. I'm going to, for the stuff staying, hanging out the front, I'm going to kind of split it around the tube and fold it underneath and wrap my thread back. And so now I have that flash covered on the top and bottom. I'm going to rotate the vise slightly, grab that other bundle, slide this underneath the thread again, line it up about 50-50, wrap back three times, and then same thing, take this that's hanging out the front, wrap it on the far side. And so now basically we have the material at like 12, 3, 6, and 9. And you can spin this in a diving loop if you want, and you can try to get more perfect coverage, but this ends up working pretty well. It's the fastest way. It's durable. And uh, if there are any clumps, you can kind of spread them out with your fingers, but this is my way of doing it. Yep, that looks good. Hey, Eddie Howells writes in. He's a longtime friend of Beulah Fly Rods. It's like having Magic and Larry on the same team. Uh, are you Magic or Larry? You're obviously Larry. <laughs> <laughs> somehow i knew you were gonna say that yeah i don't know what reasons but yeah oh man all right so this looks a little outrageous and so i'm gonna come in with a marabou blood quill and just do about two turns in the front of it And that's going to add movement and also um, tone it down just a little bit. Are you particular to tying it in butt first or tip first, or do you care? These I like tying these in butt first, and I feel like it creates more of a flare because there's a little more stiffness around the quill. And so it's a slightly I like, bigger diameter. Yeah. And so I'm just going to preen out about half an inch. That'll get me about three turns. And okay. then same thing, just fold these back, 
each turn in front of the la last one, make sure you're trying to keep all the previous materials behind it. And the three turns is a reference, to, you know, every, every marabou has a different sort of density. And so you just kind of call the shot, what looks good right. to your eye as you're tying. I'm gonna just call it good there. Now, there was a previous video that covered that same type of topic with marabou. I mean, if you have a really dense feather, you might need two turns. If you have a really sparse feather, you might need five. But when it looks right, it looks right. Yep. So now, one of the things about tying on tubes is if you want, you can tie them in the round, which means that there's no top or bottom that, uh, you know, like a woolly bugger from any... Um, sort of perspective it has the same sort of shape i like mine to feel like there's a top and a bottom on this particular fly and i learned through mistakes that the more materials you have on one side there's going to be more drag in the water and that's going to cause yeah. the fly to, to hang up that version so if you want the fly to um purposely uh ride right side up add more material on the top i learned this by uh, trying to do like some Lady Caroline old school space and putting too much mm -hmm. hackle on the bottom. And I was looking at this fly that took me, you know, an hour to tie and it was upside swinging down. upside down. Right. So, yeah. um, so, but this one, I want to be right side up. So I'm going to come in and add a little bit more winging material. This is angel hair. It's a mix of like copper and um, purple. And that's pretty key. I think that ostrich you put on there is going to look great when it's riding dorsal up or tracking across the current dorsal up. But that ostrich is not enough to grab it and ride it exactly how you'd want it. Yeah. So I'm going to put this angel here in as the first wing. And uh, I want the materials to kind of spread out a little bit. So instead of just folding them back and tying them in, I'm going to bring them around the tube and then tie it down. Right. And that's just going to create a little bit more um, separation of the material. Like, I've never seen that. I've never seen that technique before. I just learned something, and that's why we're here. Well, I have to say, your videos are pretty great. Thank and, you. And um, yeah, as I'm struggling with this fly, I just kind of marvel how clean you're able to tie, even on. Uh, on on stage it's hard to do i mean I, I break a lot of thread when the video is rolling and the other thing is is i don't know about you but i tie better in my own home desk where i'm familiar with everything yeah. so now i have that flash on top and i'm going to cover it with about six strands of ostrich hurl and i'm just going to put them over like a like a little tent or a roof and i want these hurls to end up about uh, midway to the tail hurls. Yep. Better and, movement, less pumping. Yep. And I don't want them to be um, perfectly even. I want the, the hurls in the middle to be a bit, little bit longer than the ones on the side. Then the original version, I would put in grizzly hackles here, and they look really good, but. Um, when I was doing that, that was kind of back when it was hard to find grizzly hackles because of yeah. uh, the beauty stage. And so I've just put in sort of grizzly barred rubber legs now. Um, they're, I don't think they're any, they're probably less durable to be honest, but I do think there may be some vibration in the water that's worthwhile and they're a little bit easier to tie in. Yep, so this easier is just for sure. Grizzly flutter legs, tie it in 50-50. Uh, slip it under oh. the thread, do like three wraps forward. And again, I'm going to bring this underneath the tube and then come up on my side and then tie it back. And then you'll see you get like a nice little V separation there. Oh, I can't wait to get home and try that myself. And I'm serious. That's pretty cool. So interesting little fact, Mr. Ishiwata, the, the feather and the hair thing was actually started by Steven Tyler. I believe on American Idol. And then the fly fishing industry went nuts. You couldn't get it. And if you could find it, we're talking like I saw a cape sell for right around a thousand dollars for a cape. Is that insane? Well, it's market economy. 
<laughs> right. So all of those materials, they're really light and they're going to dance around a lot. And if I were going to fish just tail outs only, I'd have no problem fishing this fly as is. But this is an all-arounder. I fish it at the heads of runs, in the body, and the tail outs. And in those heads, there's so much turbulence that I need to put something with a little bit of bulk in the front in order to eat up some of that turbulence and really allow the softer materials to dance. The sure. original versions, I was always using um, Arctic Fox. And then um, when Idlewild started producing it, they said, look, there's just too much variability in, in the supply. Can you come up with a synthetic? And I was crushed because I thought Arctic Fox was the magic material. I started with craft fur and it was garbage, but um, I eventually settled on pseudo hair, which is a synthetic. Uh, yeah. it's, I like it. It's softer than, um, than craft fur and it, it has tapered ends and it spins up nicely. And so now almost all my patterns, I'm using pseudo hair in the front. Yeah, pseudo hair is definitely different than craft fur and plays much better in a dubbing loop. And I don't know if it's the denier or actual size of the hair or what, but you can, it doesn't take a magician to feel the difference. But you just, it feels more silky. It's soft. You know right away when you put the pseudo hair in, it's different than the standard craft fur or extra select craft fur, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't really notice a difference between those two. So, right. So it comes on this pelt. I'm going to preen away about. It would end up being about a pencil's diameter if you compress it or a little less. And it's pretty clutch to comb everything out. And so I just have a dog grooming brush, comb everything out. And then I saw other people were showing dubbing loops, so I'm not going to really explain too much on this one. Right. Um, I'm going to put it in my loop. And... On this one, I want about a quarter of the material or maybe a little less than a quarter of the material on the butt end and then okay. three quarters tapered out. And that if anything, I want the butts to kind of taper in over time so there's less bulk as you get to the last wraps. The thing that gives it bulk is you end up doubling up these fibers at the base. Right. And so a bulkier pattern, you put more on the butts uh, a sparser pattern you'd have more uh, uh, on the tips and you can actually see you've actually built that taper into the butts as we're looking at it right now right yeah yep and that looks like it's yeah so it's going to be bulkier towards the fly and then sparser yep. towards the front yep yep i want the last reps to just kind of drape over yep. so you spin it up you'll know how much you can spin it based upon the thread that you use i know for this about eight spins is right um, and then it's it looks like terrible. Yeah. So just come in with that dog brush again and be pretty aggressive and comb it out until you see the core of it is about, you can see the diameter of the thread. It shouldn't be too much bulkier than the thread. And I like this grooming brush because uh, you can be really aggressive without breaking materials or breaking your thread. And it works as the back scratcher, correct? Uh, uh, <laughs> the dad joke portion of the video. I got a million of them, Ish. All right, so it looks like this now. I'm gonna just preen it all to one like side, a hackle. just like a hackle, and then come in and um, wrap it each one, each wrap right against the last one. Don't worry if the tips are getting tangled right now. You'll comb that out later on. Just really focus on how the material is laying in right against the tube. Boy, Ish, if you're, I've seen this fly in the past and did you this the this particular fly as well as the blue and black one i mean they can be go like you said it's a go-to trout fly but i man i see steelhead and, and even chinooks with that same pattern i think that's a really really well thought out colorway size style castability thanks uh so this actual color pattern here it's proven to be a pretty surprising producer for southern oregon steelhead 
And yeah, this is that doesn't surprise me. One that I specifically developed for a low light trout, but um, the other good thing about tubes is uh, I don't have to tie a special set of flies to to go to Oregon anymore. I just would put a different hook on same fish the same yeah. pattern with just a different hook. I mean that kind of gets back to your earlier uh, you know little tutorial about the weight. You know if you wanted if that wasn't a weight adjustable fly and you wanted three different weights in one pattern, you wanted six of each, you'd have to tie 18. Now you can take off with six and you've got all the weight, right? Yeah. And then because you can change the hook size, you don't have to do another set for steelhead versus trout. I mean, that really makes simplifies your life as far as getting to the river and having what you need. Yeah, and you must do the same thing. But in my waiter pouch, I have like a little, a little box that has different weights and hooks. And so I'm able to make all those adjustments right on the river. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I have a, just a really small plastic box. It's got some weights and different size hooks in it. That's always with me. So I'm just going to do whip finish here. And then I have a lot of confidence in this color cone for uh, low light conditions. Bruce, I always call it tennis ball yellow. What's the official name? I think the, the so we don't have a perfect chartreuse. We have fluorescent green and fluorescent yellow. I believe that's the fluorescent yellow. That's the hotter yellow, or uh, almost looks exactly like a tennis ball. It's a good. That's what it should be called. Yeah, I, I prefer this over the fluorescent green. So I'm going to come so up with this crazy glue, wipe a little bit of the threads and a little bit of the tube, and then press this in. And. Um, Trim the little nubbies off there. So that's it for tying. Now you yeah. can see here, it's uh, it has two raw weights in it. If you to adjust the weight, you just slide this back tube off, and then you can take out both the small and the medium, and then say, "Oh, I just want the small on." So then you slide the small on the tube. And then to lock it in place with the large tube there, and then now you're just you just cut off your hook and retie, and you're all ready to go. I love it. Now with that heavy weight, you know we got the traditional trout state kind of guys that are throwing to the bank from a boat. They want the heavy fly to sink and strip it out of there. Do you put much action on the flies when you're fishing with a spare rod, or are you just kind of letting it buck all off steelhead style? So I, I never mess up. If I, if you see me and I'm like jigging during my swing, you know, I've had like a pretty rough day and I, I'm like throwing the kitchen sink at them. I swing because I love that grab yep. and I get the best grabs on a dead swing. And so 95% of the time, 98% of the time, I'm just doing a dead swing. It really maybe would produce more fish if I were messing around with it more. But um, that's just not not what I want to do. And how much of a confidence boost is copper flash in almost any fly you tie color wise? Uh, so, so my number one confidence for trout, sunny conditions, I'm going to fish this pattern in tan and gold with a red head. And this okay. is probably produced hands down the most fish and maybe the most big fish. Then... As soon as the light starts going down, if it's overcast, I'm going to probably go with this black copper and chartreuse. And then for the in-between times, uh, maybe variable light or so, then I'm going to fish uh, olive and copper. And when I used to fish a ton, uh, I felt so dialed in that I'd be it'd be sunny and I'd be catching fish with this tanning, tanning gold. And clouds would roll in. And as soon as I saw the clouds were kind of changing the lighting on the river, I'd switch to olive and copper. And so many times, first swing, there'd be a fish. And then uh, same thing, as the light got darker, I'd go in with black copper and chartreuse, and automatically you're back into the fish. So I, I do feel it's more than just confidence because I hand these flies out to people I fish with, and um, we have really similar results. And does that take into account like a glacially tinted waterway? Or are you more worried about sunlight, cloud, time of day kind of stuff? Well, I fish tailwaters mostly. And so we don't deal so, with glacial runoff. Okay. 
we deal with like snow melt, which usually yeah. turns it kind of muddy. And so um, uh, if the water were had a lot of runoff in it and it was muddy, brownish or tannish, I probably wouldn't be fishing the tan and gold because again, you're not going to get right. enough of a contrast to the background. If it's if it's muddy like that, I'm going to be fishing blacks probably. Yeah, the snow melt can make a glacier color, but you're probably talking more about running off the banks rather than coming downstream. Yeah, absolutely. It's coming right off the banks or feeder creeks. Feeder creeks are coming in, and right where that feeder creek is dumping in, it's just kind of puking brown. So, yeah, we're just talking mud, muddy brown. We're not talking glacial tint at all with your snow melt. What do you got? Up, what's coming up next, Mr. Ish? Well, first off, James, you're not the boss of me. And so <laughs> I'm going to just show you the second fly. I'm not going to tie this, but in terms of uh, producing, this uh, two bugger uh, gets a bunch of numbers. Ooh. And uh, I'm not going to tie it because I think most people watching can figure out how to tie a two bugger. It has the tail a standard body, and then I tie it off and add one of those raw weights, a small raw weight, and then put a collar in front with an ultra small ultrasonic disc in front. And um, I fish these in heavy water. So if uh, I'm fishing behind somebody and I gave them the good part of the run, uh, and I'm going to have to fish either a rock garden or the head of a pool, uh, I'm going to fish these flies because they drop really quickly. And in that high flows, high turbulence, uh, it holds its shape because of this ultrasonic disc and the uh, saddle hackles. It holds a, a nice profile uh, in heavy water. And um, I just have a, a lot of confidence in this. So this would be my number two fly for searching. Same thing uh, in uh, sunnier conditions. I'm going to fish things in creams like a vanilla bugger. Or a bronze. Hold that up so we can see it if you would. That fly is vicious. I've caught a lot of nice trout with that fly. Yeah, yeah. so this is just, you can do whatever bugger you have conf confidence in. I like the vanilla bugger or a bronze bugger with a gold cone and a small raw weight. Um, and then for low light, I've gotten, I've caught some unexpectedly good browns. Um, which are kind of our prize, like big browns are our prize out here uh, with black and red. Yeah, on the video that almost looks maroon, but that's got the little bit of black over the red, probably giving it that tint. But that, is that like a maraschino cherry red back in? I think it's, uh, that would be cool, but I, I think it's probably just called red marabou. Love it. Looks good. It's red in the base, then black mixed in, and then uh, black and red chenille with red rib. And then I put a small white soft tackle in front and these just crush. And, <laughs> I was gonna tie one, but now now I'm gonna just show. <laughs> I can actually talk less if you feel like tying another ish. I love it. You, this is great. All right. So, Bruce, can you talk about the snitch while I transition materials? Yeah, sure. So, the snitch is probably, I, I would almost call that a tweener fly between the, the like vanilla bugger or two bugger you just showed and the first um, Grandmaster. And that historically issue started tying that with pine squirrel, right? Instead of rabbit. Yeah. Do, do you use rabbit or do you use mostly pine squirrel? Um. I, I do both. The reason I switched to um, rabbit was you can get the micro cut rabbits that were barred. And again, I like okay. the barred, barred function. Yeah. Uh, the, the this variation. is an easy, easy casting fly. And I, mean, I don't know if you know this, but that little blue and black um, snitch with the orange bead on the front, I've taken shoot hooks on the coast with that. A, a steelhead fish with it. You can cast it on a scanning line. You don't need a skagit. That this is a good versatility fly for just about any anatomous species or trout. Right. Well, I'm going to tell you the new version of this, the super snitch. So these are all in uh, 
Montana fly catalogs. And uh, the new version, I tie them on jig hooks now because I think um, it rides level. And I like that rather than being kind of canted. Right, you almost can't do it with a tube or a standard, you know, fire line extended hook or whatever. But the jig hooks really allow that fly to ride almost perfectly level. That's a good deal. Yep. So uh, I have a size 12 streamer jig hook and a copper bead that's uh, 3.8 millimeters. It's tungsten, so um, you kind of have to undersize them a little bit. Otherwise, they'll hang up a ton. Okay. Bringing the thread back to the bend. And then I'm going to have a trailer hook on this. And I always use Berkeley Fireline 20 pound for my trailer hooks. And I'm going to measure out four inches. And then and if you were it. to tie a, a version of this for steelhead ish, would you move that away from 20 pound to 35? I don't know if there's a necessity to do that. Well, I catch very small, very weak steelhead, so you probably could be fine. But <laughs> uh, other people, if you would want to want to up it up a little bit. And the one thing that's really nice about the 20 pound is it's super easy to feed through the rear hook, through the yeah. eye to feed the hook on. The other thing is, I think if, if I knew I were going to fish this for steelhead, um, I'd probably take extra precautions on lashing down the trailer material to make sure that it was doubled or tripled back. I've never really right. had a trailer loop pull out, but um, uh, I'd be heartbroken if, if it did. <laughs> Start guiding for steelhead in the northwest, and the guys that get a fish their flies that show up with, you'll see it. They, I know there's still a lot of people that don't know about doubling it back, so we might even talk about that real quickly. That's a big key for keeping the hook attached to the fly. Yeah, so on that one, I tied it in across from the bend. I measured out an inch and a half, so the loop material is an inch and a half here. And then I took the thread forward to the bead and then folded the tags back and wrapped them back. And uh, that's that's very strong and if you have any concerns about it i would just say like at home hook it up to your fence post and start yarding on it with eight pound maxima and it's it's not going to go anywhere um i feel even more confident though if you pass those tags through the eye of the hook and then fold them back but it's just a little bit more uh more of a pain to do and i haven't needed it for trout Yep, and it's such a bummer when you are holding a hook that can't be fixed with the trailer gone. Yeah. On a nicely so, tied fly. This is a Montana fly loosened chenille in uh, extra small micro size. I'm going to just use this to make a butt. I'm going to wrap forward three pearl? times. Uh, it's uh, cream, I think. It's sand. So I went forward three mm. times. Now I'm going to cross diagonally backwards and then cross diagonally forwards. And that makes a nice little ball. This pattern, it just came from Montana Fly sending new materials and saying like, hey, think about this. And this whole thing came out of just thinking about these new materials. This is the other one. What do they call this, Bruce? Oh, man. Lucent <laughs> wrap. Say it again. And so uh, yeah. it's marred plastic. I'm going to take about 20 of these out. And uh, for this pattern, I wanted something that would kind of look like a crayfish, kind of look like a stonefly, and kind of look like a leech. And so uh, I'm going to put these in 50 50. And these are going to be kind of my claws if it were a crayfish, wrap it down. And then again, I'm gonna bring this around the far side to the near side, just for a little bit more separation. And tie that in there. So we're looking like this. Um, bring your trailer loop out of the way. And then uh, you can just trim it to more of a claw shape.
then I'm going to come in with some marabou. And I'm going to come in. This is going to be a brown fly with yellow. We have a lot of golden stones that are starting to move around. And so mm -hmm. I just i am thinking about those triggers. Peeling this off the marabou quill. I'm going to have these extend about halfway into the uh, loosened wrap. And you're kind of veiling it. And then I found that that was like not enough material in the water to stand out. So I'm going to trim those butts and then put these butts in about halfway as well. Is that just a stiffener for the back end so it doesn't foul? Yeah, it helps with the 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 loosen wrap definitely stiffens everything up. Okay. And then um, the marabou gives some color contrast. So, Ish, real quickly, we've got a question from Silver Miner about asking if he can watch a replay of this video. And, yes, I think – I don't know if it's going to be tonight or in the morning, but all of these Beulah Live hours from 5 to 6 on Tuesdays are up permanently, so you can re-watch them, check them out, leave comments, um, look at materials, all of the above. Thanks for the question. All right. So I re-tied in my micro chenille in a funny way. I'll explain that in a second. And then I'm going to come in with uh, these rubber legs. And these are the MFC centipede legs. And I just have to say, try to make sure you get the new version. I think we all tied with the old version where the barring was painted on. And once you stretched it, it kind of, the black disappeared. Off. Yeah. But it looks like these are kind of baked in. So they're more durable. I took it straight off the card. I cut it in half. And these legs, I want to hang down the way that like a stonefly or a crayfish leg hangs, not off the side, but straight down. So I'm going to tie it in this way, kind of in a V, bring it back, and then splay it out. So it kind of, they'll be hanging from the bottom, if that makes sense. Yep. Come forward and then do the same thing. I think everything I'm talking about imitating has like six eight legs, but I'm just going to put in four. I'm going to do one loose wrap just to hold the um, legs out of the way for now. Take the loosen wrap and just kind of cover up the threads on my body. So all of those invertebrates, whether it's a crayfish or a stonefly, they're bought there undersides are going to be a lighter color so on this one i'm thinking it'd be nice if it was a lighter lighter color too right let those legs go tie this off and then when i tied that uh material in i left this little tag in and i'm going to use that and i'm going to pull it forward just to separate everything potentially Just bring this forward right in the middle. And then you can play with these legs to get them hanging down. Now, next step is a zonker. And for that, I want to go back to pine squirrel. Pine squirrel for president. Yep. And so the main thing you want to do is you want to make sure that the hide is going to at least extend back to the end of that trailer hook because we need to attach the trailer hook to the hide. So that's right. looking, it's probably going to be about two inches. I have my pine squirrel and then I'm going to steer this with the hook right in the middle of the hide. Take it out of the vise, slide it around, and then um, Johnny King told me about liquid fusion, and he told me for his saltwater flies, which I can never make look anywhere near as good as his, but I don't know, understand how this works, but it's like 
sort of water sol soluble, but then is a total cement once it dries. So this is a, a liquid fusion that's been slightly thinned. I'm gonna just put it on the chenille body there. And that when it dries on that hide, uh, it'll be completely locked in and you don't have to worry about trying to bring wire thread, wire rips through to, to or monofilament. Is that monofilament. what are you thinning that with, Eric? Is that like a denatured alcohol or just a rubbing alcohol? Just water. I think, I think Johnny recommended like one part water, three parts liquid fusion or something like that. Um, so I tied that hide in now forward. And then I'm going to just end with another pseudo hair head. But this one I want to keep small. So I'll go into um, one of these pseudo hair hides that I've worked on quite a bit. And I'm just going to take the butt ends and maybe I want it to be about three quarters of an inch. Did you give us a uh, color on this one, Ish? This color? Yeah, on the pseudo. Uh, I think it's I think it's either brown or something like orangutan. <laughs> hey, I resemble that statement. Set it in the dabbing loop like that. Spin it up. Similar taper on the butts? Yeah. But this is going to just be bulkier. Um, think of it as kind of like a muddler head. And for those who tuned in early, you may have seen a recipe uh, towards the end of the show or just slightly after the end of the show. We will have the recipes posted so you can check out uh, and or save and copy the recipes to the flies being tied. Generously donated by our friend Eric Ishiwata. And so this would be a brown and yellow version. Um, uh i like it in again kind of a tan and gold jig and then uh, this has been a good one as well kind of olive thin mint color olive brown and black with a lucent like a shiny metallic pink bead this has worked well in uh, free stones in off color conditions and then uh in the middle of winter uh when Crayfish kind of, in my area anyways, they kind of have bluish claws and a little bit more olive. Uh, this lightish town tan with some blue and olive has done well also. Maybe hold that up just a hair higher for us, Ish. There we go. Yeah, and the um, first one as well, so we can get a color idea. Looks really good. That's a dynamite pattern. And uh, you can see kind of, the materials on the bottom. I just want it to look like a crayfish, stonefly, sculpin, leech. You know, have a lot of those triggers all in one fly. Uh, it's jigged, so it rides level. And then also it has uh, a little bit less chance of hanging up. And then in the back, I use a Gamakatsu Globa hook, either a six or an eight. Okay. And I just hitch that on the way that Jerry French hitches on for his little leeches. And uh, this has been my go-to. So if I had to fish tomorrow, I'd probably have a Grandmaster Flash, one of those buggers, and one of these leeches. And uh, I'd have them in two or three colors, and I'd feel pretty confident that I'm going to be able to find fish. Yeah, it looks good. Thanks a lot for coming and tying with us for an hour. It was wonderful having you, seeing you, talking with you. And um, when's your next fishing outing? Uh, depends on work, maybe, 
maybe, maybe next Thursday. You do stay busier than most. We finished this in an hour, even a minute under, but thanks again so much for your time. Um, we're not going to announce next Tuesday's tire. We have another mystery tire for next Tuesday. And uh, thank you, Eric Ishiwata, so much for coming and spending some time with us from the great state of Colorado. May all your may the force be with you. And thanks, Bruce and James. And then also a big shout out to Miss Ayel for keeping all the technical stuff on lock for us way down in La Paz. Isn't it great?